Today, I'm going to discuss a time that took place after Al Diaco began cooperating. As most people know, Al Diaco was the former Lucchese acting boss and took control when Vicar Musso and Gaspipe became fugitives sometime in 1990. In this instance, you have a boss and his underboss living as fugitives while trying to run a family. Their only option to do so was to depend on other family members to send and bring messages and information. Despite their elevated level of paranoia while evading arrest, the people bringing and sending messages were not only jockeying for position, but paranoid themselves. To put this in better perspective, all it took was one of those people to tell either Vic or Gas the following. This Frankie, I don't trust him. We got to watch him closely. And in two or three weeks, Frankie would be found in the trunk of his car. And this is what was happening. Again, guys like Al Diaco, Picciotto, and Bruno Facciolo, just to name a few, were not informants, but falsely accused of being informants. As a result, Facciolo was killed, Chiotto was shot over 12 times but survived, and they plotted on killing Diaco. The Lucchese family's pattern is they label innocent members and convict them by sentencing them to death without a trial or even a conversation. Sometimes they succeed and the person gets killed. But when they fail at killing someone and their intentions and betrayal are exposed and now the person actually cooperates, the Lucchese family covers up their disloyalty by telling anyone who will listen, you see, we were right. When conversely, they were 100% in the wrong. You see, loyalty by all means is a two-way street. As an example, I ask everyone listening who's married, if your other half cheats on you and you being 100% loyal, would that sit well with you? When being inducted, you're told the family is your new family, and you should put this new family before your actual family. Driving this point further, you're told that if your child is dying in the hospital and someone from your new family calls you, you're expected to leave your child's side and go to them. Again, I have a question for viewers. Do any of your families try to get you killed or plot to kill you? Maybe a few of you will say yes, and I suggest you skip the next holiday dinner. Personally, my actual family has never even looked to see me in any pain, let alone kill me. But that new family, the Lucchese family did. And at that point, it was my belief, and I'll continue to stand by it, all bets were off. The ceremony, the oath, everything becomes irrelevant. And speaking of the oath, I revert back to my early question. Marriage is also considered an oath. How many of you would remain loyal to the very person who betrayed you? The insignificant clowns would have the world believe, as they sit behind a keyboard, that if placed in the same situation, they would have handled things differently and never cooperated. I ask the intelligent people, what do you think they do? Anyway, the Lucchese bosses implemented a ruling panel, but after some time, Vic had a change of mind. Joe DeFiti and Vicar Musso's friendship can be traced back to their teenage years in Canarsie, Brooklyn. Initially, both young men gravitated to the Colombo family. Vic was a former member of the Joe Gallo crew and was eventually released to the Lucchese family. DeFiti remained the Colombo associate into the 80s, but he too was released to the Lucchese. Vic became inducted in the late 70s, and DeFiti's induction took place in either 1989 or 1990. At the time, he ran a number spot out of a hot dog truck in Brooklyn, as well as being involved in such rackets as gambling, loan sharking, and extortion schemes. But he still found time to join Vic as his handball partner. The two of them could be seen playing in both Brooklyn and in Charles Park in Howard Beach. Vic would go on to become the official boss of the family, and at some point in time, DeFiti was elevated to a captain's position. After Vic's June 30th, 1991 arrest in Scranton, Pennsylvania, Bureau of Prison Records indicate that DeFiti was a frequent visitor of Vic Amuso's. During the visits, they attempted to whisper a speaking code to avoid detection. Nevertheless, their recorded conversations, although the quality was poor, had them speaking about Lucchese business. In essence, DeFiti became Vic's point man to send and receive messages. After Diaco's departure, Vic decided he wanted to put another act in boss in place, despite having a ruling panel. You have to understand the dynamics behind this. Those panel members, who were not only making decisions, but enjoying the fruits of all the Lucchese money being kicked up, when they learn that Vic is implementing another acting boss, they're obviously not thrilled about hearing this news. So the person stepping into this position already has enemies in camp with the members of the ruling panel. It was no secret that Vic placed people in these acting positions that he knew he could control, but more specifically, that would keep his envelopes coming. I quickly want to mention the super thanks icon found underneath this video for anyone who'd like to support the channel. Joe DeFiti was the person that Vic picked to be the new acting boss. 
I personally never met him because he was before my time. However, I never heard one person say anything good about him. I believe they just disliked him. It's like a new person coming to a job who has to deal with the office gossip, but on a much larger scale. Defeaty's time as acting boss was short-lived, and by April 1998, he was indicted on a nine-count racketeering case involving the Lucchese's control in New York's garment district. At the time, and since 1991, the Lucchese family had been extorting businesses in the garment center and pocketing over $400,000 a year. Defeaty eventually pled guilty in exchange for a five-year sentence. To fill the voided position, Stevie Korea was picked to replace Defeaty. And from the time Korea took control, the money being kicked up to Vic increased as opposed to the money that Defeaty was turning in, a fact that was not lost on Vic, who believed Defeaty skimmed more than a million dollars in Lucchese money. Several members of the family, including Louis Dedon and Dom Tricello, began questioning Defeaty about the missing money. Defeaty reached out to his friend Vic, asking him to intervene, but the message he received back was not a promising one. Vic told him that he would get back to him. Consequently, Vic ordered his murder. Over time, Defeaty caught wind that he was marked for death. According to Dom Tricello, who voiced his dislike of Defeaty, he believed someone tipped him off that he was going to be hit. And while in prison with Defeaty, Dom said he knew he was going to flip after he was questioned about the missing money. In February 2002, Defeaty went to the FBI and began cooperating. When this news hit the street, the Lucchese sent members into his son's steakhouse in Howard Beach as an intimidation tactic. One of the guys that was sent was none other than Johnny Cyburns. As a result, the FBI paid visits to Stevie Korea and Louis Dedon to give them a warning not to retaliate and to stay out of the restaurant. In October 2002, Defeaty appeared as a federal witness in the trial of Lucchese member John Petroselli. Petroselli was a former member of the Bronx Yonkers-based Tanglewood Boys who faced murder charges from a 1995 stabbing. Defeaty testified about what took place after the incident. According to him, the acting Genovese boss, Barney Belomo, called for a meeting to discuss what took place. Barney requested that the matter be put to bed with no further violence or revenge, which Defeaty agreed to. While on the stand, he testified about the Lucchese family shaking down several restaurants, including the Palm in Manhattan, the now defunct Tony Romans in Howard Beach, among others, as well as three construction companies, Scalamandri, Northbury, and Pecone. He explained that violence didn't come into play when collecting the extortion money. It just came automatically. People knew that it was for the Lucchese family, and basically they paid on time. In one shakedown scheme, Peter Scalamandri and Sons were paying the Lucchese family $40,000 a year to prevent labor issues. Basically, the Lucchese's ensure labor peace for these construction companies, like preventing strikes and enabling them to use non-union workers on projects. A jury convicted Petroselli, and he received a life sentence. The following year at Pete Gotti's racketeering trial, Defeaty testified that Gotti attended meetings during the 90s, meetings that were only intended for bosses. He also explained that during his time as acting boss, he made a little over a million dollars in a four-year period. The money was delivered to him in paper bags and bathrooms of local diners. Joey DiBenedetto told me a story around the time when Defeaty first started cooperating. Joey was approached by two guys who handed him a paper bag for Defeaty containing over $200,000. Obviously, they weren't aware of what was happening. Joey told me he put the bag in his closet for a while, and when no one mentioned it or came to collect it, he began spending it until nothing was left. Defeaty and his second wife eventually signed out of the Witness Protection Program and gave interviews in April and May in 2010, where he stated that he and his wife were living on a fixed monthly income. So who knows what he did with all the money that he had. The following year in 2012, Joe Defeaty died in Florida. In my opinion, had the Lucchese family returned loyalty where they received it, they would have faced less setbacks than they did by labeling its members. Mm -hmm.